Let's pray. Lord God, we come this morning to celebrate that you are our God and our King. And it is our honor to come and worship you. But also, Lord, we thank you that you have given us baptism. Lord, a dying to self, a joining together with you. We thank you for this, this joy that we have this morning. And we pray that your spirit, your Holy Spirit, would ascend upon us and fill us up with joy and with peace and praise. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. In 1972, during the winter of my high school, uh, the senior year of high school, a friend of mine realized that his draft number was coming up. Now, this is toward the end of the Vietnam War, but they were still doing conscription. So what he did, he signed up for the delayed entry program of the Marine Corps. And as soon as he graduated from high school that spring, he would go to boot camp. And that way he wouldn't have to serve the three to four years, I don't remember what it is, that, that if you were drafted, that you had to serve. And instead he could serve six months active duty in six years in the reserves. Now he had long hair. He was really out of shape. He's a couch potato. And he was a real smart aleck. I don't remember what he was expecting when he left for boot camp. But he found out he did not belong to his mama anymore. <laughs> he belonged to the United States Marine Corps, lock, stock, and barrel. Boot camp is, was designed to make the recruit a Marine. And my understanding is that they're very, very good at doing that. Thirteen weeks later, he came home from boot camp with some hilarious stories of how they dealt with his arrogance his laziness, and his general, bad, his general bad attitude. I almost didn't recognize him. He had a Marine haircut. He was lean. And the whole time he's on furlough, before he went back, he ran five miles every day. He didn't drive five miles every day before. <laughs> but more than anything else was a difference in his attitude. He wasn't the same person. He was a Marine, and he was proud of it. It's truly amazing what can happen in a short period of time when a person is immersed in, into something as intense as boot camp, there's bound to be a change in their life and in their attitude. I found the same thing to be true for those who turn to follow Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. It changes everything. Today we have the joy of being present for the baptism of, of Phyllis Parrish and the opportunity of renewing our own baptismal vows that we once made. And before we do that, I want to speak briefly about the reality of what baptism and it, what it actually is and how it changes everything in our lives and points us to a new way of living. Many people believe that the sacrament of baptism is just a ritual and so is the Eucharist, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Nothing could be further from the truth. Right Reverend Dr. John Rogers in his book, Essential Truths for Christians Concerning Baptism, he wrote this. Baptism in the New Testament embodies the full range of the gospel and of salvation. The fullness of salvation in Christ is signed and sealed in baptism, just as the full range of salvation is celebrated in the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. For this reason, the two are referred to as the sacraments of the gospel because they are the two sacraments that Jesus himself instituted for the church. In other words, they're not rituals, but are means whereby God pours out his love and his grace upon the believer. Rogers wrote that baptism embodies the believer and gives him the full range of the gospel and salvation. And the Lord's Supper allows the believer to celebrate the full range of salvation. But what does that mean? Well, Article 27 of the 39 Articles of the Anglican Church identifies that full range of salvation. It says, baptism is not only a sign of profession and mark of difference whereby the Christian Christian men and women are discerned from others that, can, uh, that are not, have not been christened. But it's also a sign of regeneration or new birth. 
whereby as by an instrument they that receive baptism rightly are grafted into the church. The promises of forgiveness of sin and our adoption to be the sons of God by the Holy Ghost are visibly signed and sealed. Faith is confirmed and grace increased by power, by virtue of power and the prayer unto God. So let's look again at Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism is the sign and the seal of, uh, of the new covenant. And it joins those who have saving faith in Jesus Christ. This union with Christ has many implications. But here Paul concentrates on, concentrates on the believer's union with Christ and his death and resurrection. Christ died with respect to sin and the curse of the law. And believers do the same. Just as Christ rose to new life, so believers rise to new life in him. The new believer takes on a new identity. And as we talked about last week, he, he becomes a living member of a new family that has the privilege and the joy of intimacy and in calling the Lord God Almighty, our Heavenly Father, Abba, Daddy. This new relationship also entitles the one being baptized to come to the, the family meal, the Lord's Supper and further experience God's grace and nourishment. These are not rituals, but they're means to the life-giving grace of God in and through Jesus Christ. One of my favorite Christian authors and one of my cloud of witnesses is Dr. J.I. Packer. This dear saint of God left life here and went home to his eternal joy with his heavenly father, beholding Jesus face to face on Friday, July 17th. He was 93 years old and he was virtually blind from macular degeneration. But he continued to, to defend the Bible as the word of God and Jesus Christ as the only way to salvation. Leland Ryan, who's a professor of English at Wheaton College, wrote a biography about Packer, and he, it's entitled J.I. Packer, An Evangelical Life. And he wrote this, When I asked late in life what his final words to the church might be, Packer replied, I think I can boil it down to four words. Glorify Christ every way. That can serve as an epitaph for what Packer did in his lifetime and what he's doing right now. In 2010, Packer wrote a, a seminal article, a wonderful article on baptism based on Romans 6, 3, and 4. I want to read you a, a portion of that. Christian baptism, which has the form of a ceremonial washing, just like John's pre-Christian baptism, is a sign from God that, that signifies inward cleansing and remission of sins. Spirit wrought regeneration and new life and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit as God's seal testifying and guaranteeing that one will be kept safe in Christ forever. Baptism carries these meanings because first and fundamentally it signifies a union with Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. And this union with Christ is the source of every element of our salvation. Receiving the sign in faith assures the persons baptized that God's gift of new life in Christ is freely given to them. And at the same time, it commits them to live henceforth in a new way as committed disciples of Jesus. Baptism signifies a watershed point in a human life because it signifies a new creational engrafting into Christ's risen life. What an honor to be invited to share, to share life with Jesus. It's, how we're, it's one of the main characteristics of what we experience and is promised to us in baptism. Now, Jesus is always the perfect model of what it means to glorify the Father and to live our lives according to His Word. He was our model at the very beginning of His ministry when He submitted to, 
to baptism, a baptism of repentance, John's baptism, even though he was sinless. It's recorded in Luke 3, 21 and 22. Now when all people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. As we've discussed before, Jesus had no need to repent. He was sinless. But he submitted to the will of the Father by going through the water of baptism. And the Father's response was delight. And pouring out the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came right down and rested upon him. The power he was going to, to need to do all that the Father had sent him to do. The Father publicly professes that this is my Son. Jesus would eternally be the God-man and the only one who could make the perfect sacrifice to atone for our sins. In our passage from Luke 12, 49 to 53, we find a continuation of Jesus glorifying the Father by again submitting to baptism. But this time it was a baptism into death. The fire that he cast symbolized the judgment on sin that was accomplished at the cross. His death as a baptism spoke of this imagery that points to death. Liturgically, baptism came to mean a death to a way of life and being raised up to a whole new way of living. And Jesus accepted all of this as a divine way of bringing salvation to sinners. In the same way that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus at the waters of baptism, which would only come, the Holy Spirit would only come to us when Jesus continued with the plan of the Father and went to the cross. So we see that Jesus' baptism into death overcame the power of sin and death so that sinners could be saved and brought about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with fire. The same fire caused the spread of the good news and the expansion of the gospel across the globe, which could not have happened had Jesus not accomplished the work that he did upon the cross. But why would Jesus use baptism, the word baptism, to describe his suffering and death? I think it's because what he experienced was true and complete death on the cross in a way that you and I will never, ever have to. He was fully immersed into, into agony and pain, separation from his father, and the weight and the absolute horror of becoming sin on our behalf. And Paul captures it beautifully in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Paul continues in Romans 6, 5 to 7. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For no one who has died, for, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Baptism brings about this, this new lifelong pattern of the, in the life of the believer that involves dying to self and to sin daily, allowing the Holy Spirit to raise us up to a new life and not stopping. I want more, more of the new life. And God will take us to places we never imagined. But it requires we put off our old self and put on the obedience to Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we reject the darkness of sin and embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and submit to the waters of baptism, we we move from death to life, from light to darkness. I mean, from darkness to light. And today we invite our, our dear sister Phyllis to be baptized as a sign and a seal of what has gone on in her life inwardly. 
and the reality that she desires Jesus Christ to be the Lord of her life. And this we rejoice with her. And we recommit our lives to that same reality within our hearts by renewing the vows that we made at our baptism. It's easy to make vows, but we need to be remembered, remembering on a, on a regular basis what those vows were and what it means to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, what it is to have that new life and to live that way and invite others into it as well. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we thank you for, for the joy that we have before us. We thank you, Lord, that you have made a way for us to know you and to live with you, to share life with you. Lord, it sounds so fantastic, almost impossible. How could we share our lives with you? But Lord, you have made it possible through the cross. And you invite us to experience you. You invite us to know you intimately more and more and more. And, and Lord, that's what we want. And right now, Lord, that's exactly what we need. We need to become a people who stand up in newness of life and proclaim your name in power and boldness. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you into this moment with us. In Jesus' name, amen.